Welcome to a new episode of the Just Another Mindset podcast, the show that inspires you to change and live a more exciting life. My name is Ishmael, and each week I bring to you a relevant conversation, message or topic that will not only entertain you, but help you to change towards a more meaningful and satisfying life, individually and collectively. Let us get inspired and embrace collective changes for the better. In today's episode, I have the great opportunity to talk to Dan Stein, who is Giving Green's co-founder and director and the chief economist at ID Insight. Dan is passionate about using evidence-based approaches to fight the climate crisis. Prior to ID Insight, Dan worked as an economist at the World Bank, where he launched a program of impact evaluations in energy and environment. Dan further holds a PhD in economics from the London School of Economics and a BA in physics and political economy from UC Berkeley. In this episode, we talk about great news from the US in regard to climate change mitigation. We discuss what it means to be a responsible member of society and what we all can do in order to identify the most cost-effective policy and create an impact. We discuss why the climate goals until 2030 rather act as an organizing principle, and we talk about the role of technology. We discuss the example of solar panels and climate policy changes in the US and related challenges and success stories. We detail Australia and discuss critical industry sectors and highlight positive outlooks before talking about the urge for alternative jet fuels and cold play. Finally, we talk about the food system and emissions from beef in particular, and we elaborate on the alternative protein industry on what makes us hopeful about it. And with that, Dan, a warm welcome to the Just Another Mindset podcast. And my first question for you today is, how do you feel and what is on your mind? <laughs> how do I feel? Um, honestly. I'm feeling pretty good. I think um, what's been on my mind lately is the passage of the Inflation Recovery Act in the US, which is this huge victory of the climate movement. It's something that uh, to say I've been working directly in it is not exactly true, but you know the work that Giving Dream does around US policy advocacy is quite related. And it feels like an amazing, an amazing victory and weight off our shoulders and many years of of advocacy orgs pushing for this type of solution and it feels really good wonderful i'm very happy to hear that and maybe for our non-us listeners do you want to sum that up in three to five sentences what happened and what is that milestone that you are so happy about sure so basically yesterday president biden um signed into law this bill called the, the inflation Reduction Act, which is kind of a clever political name. It's really a, a bill that has a lot to do with, with both climate and some social protection elements. But uh, the, the climate elements are essentially a, uh, a number of various tax credits and incentives for different types of renewable energy technology. Um, and it's, it's something that has been in discussion for years. And as of three weeks ago, there was one holdout senator and it, it all fell apart and everyone said it's not going to pass. And then there was suddenly a last minute compromise um, and it and then it happened. So climate advocates uh, feel like it's the most consequential climate legislation the U.S. has ever passed and people are quite excited about it. Wonderful. And they should be. We can be. And thanks for sharing that. I think that's a Big step, and we all can and should be excited about that. And then you're opening up the topic already, and that is climate change mitigation. I just want to call it what we can talk about today. And I think we've heard a lot of stories about climate change. I think we all know that it's happening, and we all know that we have to act. But one of my main questions to begin with was, what is the main three reasons for yourself 
to be so active in climate change mitigation? Um, well, I think it's something that feels to me like the major social policy issue of our time, that we're living through this world where every year things seem to be getting warmer. Um, the, the science is basically solved. We know that we're putting more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. The world is getting warmer. It's causing all kinds of different problems. And it's even difficult to foresee what all those problems will be in the future. And I think I just felt a responsibility both to, you know, to others in the world and to, let's say, future generations, thinking about my children, to, to think, like, if we as a society don't rise to this challenge, then, you know, what type of society are we? How can we feel like responsible members of society? And I guess I just started to think, you know, what are the tools, what are the ways at which I can actually make a difference and what are the tools I can provide and in, and in some of, in somewhat of a a meta <laughs> a meta way you know I'll talk about giving green my organization in the in a bit but I I had this moment where I wanted to do something on climate change I didn't know what to do and so I was inspired to do something and I guess part of the thing that I was inspired to do was to develop an organization that helps people figure out what they can do to fight climate change, <laughs> inspired by my own experience. Absolutely. And when when was that moment? When did you figure out for yourself that you want to be this responsible member of society, that you want to do something about climate change? Did that happen very early in your career? Did that happen more or less recently? Can you give us a few thoughts here? Um, it's happened slowly. You know, actually, most of my career has been in working in international development. So poverty reduction, uh, did a lot of work on agriculture. Uh, you know, I work in Africa and India. And so I started, you know, most of my work was on agriculture and rural settings, and it became quite apparent how intermixed this was with climate. You know, my, my PhD work was on, on risk protection of droughts and floods. It became very clear that Droughts and floods are going to be increasing. The climate is going to be affecting the poor people in the world um, quite greatly, and that these all just seem to be quite intermingled. So, you know, I started to just very slowly over the years push my work more in the direction of climate, working a bit on forestry in the developing world, um, and then, you know, that kind of inspired me to think more about the systematic issues around climate change mitigation and started self-educating myself. So well, from one industry basically to the bigger ecosystem because they are all interlinked and intertwined to a certain extent. Okay. And before we talk about giving green and what you're doing there in a little bit more detail, Dan, can you tell us and can you tell the listeners roughly how much CO2, I believe in gigatons is the measure that you go for, is emitted in 2022 or 2021, roughly per year? Oh, I don't have that. I don't have that number in my pocket, but I bet you do. I think this is one of the numbers you looked up. So you tell us. <laughs> well, the last number I found indeed was 2019 and it was like 53 gigatons. And that's why I would be interested if it got gone up a little bit or if it already passed 60 gigatons or where do we stand on an annual level. But let's just say it's somewhere between I, 50, 60. Yeah, I think it's relatively close because it, it dropped a little bit in 2020, and then it recovered in 2021. So I think the 2019 number is relatively close to where we are now. Okay, okay. And without creating some artificial urgency, but what do you think, how much leeway do we as a global society, I'm just going to call us, have before or until we have to start acting? Or is it time to start or have started acting sometime ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have no leeway. We have to start acting. But to be fair, we are acting. I think when you actually look at in, in most wealthy countries, especially in Europe, where the Euro Europeans are a bit ahead, um, emissions have come down from their peak. They've come down in the US as well uh, a bit. And I think a lot of it is due to um, 
due to an understanding that climate change is here and pushing certain, certain policies and certain technologies. So the time to act was decades ago, and there's been some acting, but not enough. And so there needs to be, there needs to be a lot more. And what I really like about the platform that you have been creating, Giving Green, is that you, you just summed it up a little earlier, basically create an overview of different projects that people can start acting. And you talk about on your website also about being scientific, being transparent and being actionable. So my question would be, what do you understand those three attributes to be? And what is the intent behind giving green? Sure. So maybe would it help if I just give a little bit of the history of how, how giving green was developed? I think that Absolutely. gets there. So, you know, so I mentioned that I was working in international development and poverty reduction and uh, over time, I began, I was a bit more exposed to the effect of altruist space. And this is people who are really working to maximize the benefit of donations and actions in their lives to help, to help people in the world in the greatest way possible. So I was part of this evidence ecosystem in international development, still am part of it, excuse me, where we're trying to figure out what really works in terms of policy, get that information to governments and donors and help them allocate resources towards the most cost-effective, impactful things. And so there's this whole ecosystem around this in the poverty reduction international development space. But there isn't really in, or there wasn't really in the climate space. If you were, if for instance, let's say you're a person and you wanted to make a donation to have the highest impact on poverty that you can. You, I guarantee you, if you spend five minutes on Google, you're going to figure out people who have spent their life trying to answer this problem and will tell you how to allocate that money. But if you do the same for climate, or at least if you did a couple of years ago, you couldn't really, you couldn't really figure it out. There's a lot of things happening in climate. It's a very complicated issue. And it's a, very difficult to figure out where's the place that... I as an individual can actually make an impact um, with really high impact and expectation. So that's why we developed Giving Green, to try to be a resource for ways to fight climate change that, that really looked at this systematic issues where you can have where you can have leverage to make a big change. And so let me get a little bit to your question on the scientific, transparent, actionable. So I think that's that's really the, those are the pillars upon which we build the organization. The first one is scientific, and that's this, this effective altruist inspired drive towards doing really deep research on where are the places we can allocate money to most effectively fight climate change. And so I, what that means is the conclusions we've come to is that you really have to fight the systemic issues that are causing climate change. There's, we live in a society that uses a lot of energy. That energy is created mostly using fossil fuels. And there's a whole web of social norms and economic realities that drive these fossil fuels to get um, to get emitted. And if you are going to decrease fossil fuel emissions, you have to change the system. And so what we do is we try and look at what are what is the system that is causing climate, that is causing emissions? What are the pathways to reducing emissions? And what are the organizations that are working to reduce these emissions that have a special niche where their work has the, really has the ability to change some of these systemic problems, but they're also underfunded, such that you as a donor can give your can give your marginal dollar, and it's going to make a big difference. So this is the scientific is really thinking thinking about climate change as a system, thinking about what organizations have the ability to change the system and are being very effective, and um, and where you as an individual can actually um create that effect 
And then transparent, because a lot of these, these are complicated systems. We have to make assumptions. We build models. It's not all perfect. We try to put it all on our website. You know, this is what we think about this, this organization. This is what we're really sure about. This is what we're unsure about. These are the judgment calls we made. You know, so you as a person can work through our logic and you may or may not agree, but at least it's all out there. And then actionable is, you know, from our website, you can do something today. You can read the research or you don't even have to read the research. You can just see the conclusions and then you'll be presented with organizations that we really think are top class working to make these systemic changes. You can click, you can donate, you can make it. Wonderful. Thank you very much for elaborating on that. And Giving Green, I found, has three major recommendations or three focus areas. And one of them is the U.S., policy change. Another one is policy change in Australia. And another one is carbon offsets and removals. And maybe we can talk through those three examples a little bit. And I would like to start with the US policy change a little bit. And if I'm not mistaken, in the US, it's roughly emitting five megatons per year, meaning it's the second biggest emitter currently. And over time, it is the biggest emitter. Is that accurate? I don't have those numbers in front of me, but I trust you. <laughs> okay, wonderful. It's a big emitter, I'll tell you that. It's a big, okay, it's a, it's a big <laughs> emitter. And I have a quote here from a study from June 2022 from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, published in Science Daily. And it reads, to prevent the worst outcomes from climate change, the U.S. will need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in the next eight years. Scientists far from around the nation have developed a blueprint for success. My first question is, are those 50% feasible and is it enough, do you think? Well, is it technically feasible? Yes. Is it practically feasible? Um, I think it's a little bit of a long shot, but I think we're going to get close. I think the most recent projections have kind of, I've seen have shown that if everything goes well, we can get to maybe 40%. Uh, but there's a lot of ifs there. I think one thing I would say about it, these goals is that a goal like this, reduce 50% by 2030, there's nothing special about those numbers. There's nothing special about 50%. There's nothing special about 2030. These are organizing principles to help us, um, you know, help us, help us organize around goals, help us come up plans to meet these goals. You know, it's a, it's a helpful, both political and communication uh, framework. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't focus on these numbers, but I do think that this idea that we need to make drastic reductions, something like 50% by 2030 30, um, is a big deal. And I think something in that ballpark is within reach and that the, the various climate bills that have passed in 2022, this one that I spoke about before, but then also a couple others have really gone a long way towards getting us there. I think the big, the big question is how how successful will some of the new technology be? And I think I'll give a quick example. Perhaps the, the greatest victory in the climate fight to date, and people can argue about this, but certainly one of the greatest climate victories has been the immense drop in the price of solar panels in the past decade. Unprecedented, unpredicted by anyone. If you go back and you look at people's projections of the price if you go back to 2000 or even 2005, 2010, projections on the price of solar panels, you know, you would see them kind of dropping slowly, linearly, and people would say, okay, maybe they'll have in price by 2030. But they've dropped something like 70 or 90% in the past decade. It's an incredible plummeting of this technology, which has allowed it to be suddenly deployed far more widely, out competing fossil fuels. There's no point in building a new coal plant anymore because solar panels are so much cheaper. And this is just this amazing victory that people didn't see coming. 
I really think that this has given people a breath of hope. So everyone knows that solar panels are not enough, but it's like, okay, we were wrong about solar panels. What's the next thing we're wrong about? Like how quickly are the price of batteries going to come down? And I think that's the next thing. Battery prices have come way down over the past five years. And then it's like, okay, well, is wind, is wind going to come down? Are heat pumps going to come down? Um, and so there's, everyone is excited about where this next victory will be. And I think that's what causes a lot of this uncertainty. A lot of the, I mean, a lot of the policy that is happening in the U.S. are subsidies trying to drive down the price of various technologies and the extent, the extent to which this is successful, I think will really drive whether or not we reach our climate goals. Is that also a reason for R&D and for innovative technology? And is the U.S. spending big money on such things, on new technologies, on innovative Let's see question marks, but if some of those question marks actually come through, they're going to be the rising stars of the climate change mitigation movement, I want to call it. Yeah, unquestionably. There is, uh, the new climate bills have major spending for R&D in various forms. There's these direct air capture hubs, and there's hydrogen research, and then there's, you know, some of this is basic R&D, but some of it is subsidies of things that are kind of early in their market development to try just to try to increase production and get and slowly get prices down through process improvements. And I think that's a really big part of it. I mean, for instance, that's that's what happened with solar. There was no major scientific breakthrough of solar. It was just really getting the production processes down eking out little efficiencies here and there that really cause cause a massive drop. And I think we're hoping we're going to see the same thing with batteries. We're hoping we'll see the same thing with wind. We're hoping maybe with with geothermal. There's and you know there's there's plenty of others out there. But I think you're right. I do think that innovation, we're not going to beat climate change without massive innovation. I'm not saying it's the whole picture, but it's such an incredibly important part of the picture that I think both the US and governments all around the world really need to take this seriously and make strong investments. And if we talk about governments in the US and all over the world, and we talked about policy change earlier, what would you say, Dan, is your aim or your ambitions, your desires, your hopes for particular policy changes in the US? And you may choose the time frame: next five years, 10 years. Well, we just had this major victory. So it's almost like, okay, well, what comes next? I think part of it is implementing and securing these victories. So I probably wouldn't expect a major new climate bill to pass within the next five years. But there is going to be a lot of these details of, you know, can the bills get implemented? Will they get held up in court? Will they be implemented well? You know, will all this innovation money actually get allocated towards promising solutions? Will the states take up some of these policies? I think one is really implementation of these of the new of the three new climate three new bills that had climate policies this year. I think the second one is in the US, at least the subnational level, there's going to be a lot that goes to the states now that can complement the bills, that can take advantage of various provisions of the bills. You know, for, for instance, there might be a, a federal subsidy on heat pumps. States might match that with their own subsidy to really to really offer significant discounts. You also have a bunch of kind of interesting industrial policy things in the bill, these bills, where for instance, in order to get the electric car subsidies, a certain amount of the car has to be produced in the US for better or for worse. And right now that's just not the case. So no one's going to be able to get the subsidies. So it's the the legislation is hoping that. This will spur domestic industries. And if it doesn't, well, then it's kind of a useless piece of legislation. Uh, so, yeah, I think so that there's, you know, there's a lot of different, different levels there that I think cause both, both excitement, but also the knowledge that a lot of this policy advocacy work is definitely not over. You already touched it a little bit, but what do you think are 
major challenges in the US and what are also potential success stories of today or of in the future and years that you yeah would want to talk about? Yeah, I feel like I've hit some, certainly some of these new bills are success stories. Uh, I even think you have some interesting bipartisan success stories. For instance, at the end of 2020, you had an Energy Act coming out of the Trump administration that had a bunch of like bipartisan elements, mostly on research development and climate, for instance, around direct air capture. So that gives me a little bit of heart that even with various types of governments, we might still be making progress. On the other hand, you see, you also start to see some backlash, especially at the state level. I mean, one thing that has really shocked me is some of, so we know about the divestment movement uh, and so certain banks or lenders are being pressured to divest from oil and gas. What I've seen, I believe it was in Texas, is a bill that, um, or maybe it was West Virginia. It was West Virginia, actually, where they said, okay, if you're going to cave to this pressure and divest from oil and gas, then you can't work with the state of Virginia. Like, then we'll boycott you if you boycott oil and gas. And these kind of things that really worry me, some sort of like civil society backlash against climate policy that I think is quite, quite concerning. And I think is a, it's a warning signal to the climate movement that you can't do climate policy in isolation, that climate policy has to help people or people will revolt and the politicians follow the people. So I'm concerned, basically I'm, I'm, with more ambitious climate policy, I'm concerned about grassroots revolts to climate policy. Would you say that in the US, the situation to understand it's a holistic process, I want to call it, has gotten better or worse? So is there a few people that are really against the climate change movement or is the climate change movement understanding that they have to incorporate different perspective from different political viewpoints, I want to call it. I think it's, I think both of those things are true. I think that people are, there are definitely people who are against the climate movement, but then the climate movement itself has worked really hard to make as few enemies as possible. Part of it is, like I said, these, some of this more industrial policy around ensuring that the climate policy creates jobs in some of these areas that that previously had oil and gas so it's like okay we're not taking away jobs we're bringing new jobs to this area and that's a way to placate say labor and certain other subsectors and also you know the current climate bill there was an original version of the climate bill that had lots of carrots and sticks so you know if you like for utilities, you know, if you have more green energy, we'll give you a subsidy. But it also used to be, if you don't, we're going to charge you. And that could have resulted in higher energy prices. And that's the kind of thing that gets backlash. And I think I would just note, you know, I'm from the US and I spend a lot of time thinking about US policy, but this isn't necessarily just a US, a US problem. I mean, one thing that I think of very clearly are the yellow vests in France that took to the streets and blockaded roads, essentially protesting Macron's climate policy and the price of gas. So I think, I think you're going to you get this backlash anywhere. And it's something that we all have to be concerned about. I think sad story is that you're already getting it everywhere. You're getting it in different countries in Europe, you're getting it in the US. And I believe in the US, at least it's the biggest industry like for clean tech for technology so i think there is a lot of advancement that's also being done but maybe we can use that a little bit as a segue and go from the us to the second country where you have your focus and that is australia and for my understanding this is more or less i want to call it the 15th biggest emitter with point five megatons in 2019 so my first question would be how come you're focusing on Australia? Do you have big levers there or yeah, where did that come from? Yeah, 
I think there's a couple of things. I think from a really high level, we believe that policy advocacy and technology are the major, major levers by which um, by which donors and organizations can make a big difference in the climate fight. So the U.S. is an attractive place to work. Well, A, because we started the organization in the U.S., we have comparative advantage. B, I think because the U.S. is such a big driver of innovation and new companies and new technology that the idea that some new inventions could come out of the U.S. and disseminate throughout the world is, is exciting. But I, but I don't think I would go too far down this road to say like, oh my gosh, the U.S. is so important. That's why we did it. It's partially because we were here and we felt like we had comparative advantage. There are some groups in, in Europe that are, um, that are working on similar things that, you know, I think there's also important work to be done in Europe. Just in terms of U.S. versus Europe, I think there's a little bit more innovation coming out of the U.S., but I also think pushing European innovation policy would be just like, would be just an, like an amazing step forward to get the EU and European governments to push more basic science funding. Um, I also think I also think that the, the Europe is on a little bit of a better track in terms of climate policy, in terms of being much more solid to Paris goals. They have the European trading system for carbon permits. So people have made the argument that there is more, like when thinking of US versus Europe, there's more opportunity in terms of advocacy in the US because the US is in a worse position. So, but anyway, I, I, think, it's, I think it's important everywhere. But then I've been dodging your question. So why Australia? So the real purpose, the real, the, the truest answer is that we at Giving Green were approached by a large fund in Australia, the Australian Ethical Fund. They're, they run they run ethical pension funds, and they've also committed to donate 10% of their profits to, to charity. And they wanted to, um, to do something in climate. They wanted to, they read what we did in the US and they said, we really like this rational scientific approach, you know, to, to try and look at the really big levers. We don't have something like that in Australia. Can we do it? So they, they more or less commissioned us and we worked with some consultants in Australia because I, you know, I didn't know Australia so well, kind of like using our methods and their local knowledge to develop this for Australia. And then they said, look, you know, let's, let's make this all public. Let's see if we can crowd in some more money. But that being said, Australia is an interesting case. You know, I was, I was making this argument that the U S is a little bit behind Europe in terms of its climate commitments. Australia is way further behind. You know, they've been a laggard among, among developed nations in terms of taking climate policy seriously. They're, depending on the year, either the top or the or number two coal exporter in the world. They have made very few climate commitments. Their emissions, I mentioned that in the US and Europe, emissions had decreased since 2005. They have not decreased in Australia. They've more or less stayed the same. So I do think Australia is a place where um, their domestic policy really has a long way to go. And also there is this concern about them being a major coal exporter. And if you can change local policies in order to make coal extraction more expensive or more difficult or just export less, that could have knock-on effects to the rest of the world. I also think there's, there's, there was an election in Australia Earlier this year, the new party is much more open and enthusiastic about taking climate change seriously. And so I think there's this policy, potential policy window in Australia to make progress after, you know, over a decade of, of nothing. Not doing much. Okay, so there is a lot of opportunity and you already talked a little bit about the challenges. Do you have first success stories to share or do you have something that's particularly special about Australia if it comes to technology or into policy changes? Anything that comes to mind? You know, there's a couple of things that are really driving both or both economic and drivers of climate change in Australia. And the things that come to mind are mining and agriculture. So, uh, you know, Australia has lots of cows. Um, they also have, even beyond coal mining, they have 
uh, like many different types of mineral mines. This stuff is very carbon intensive. I think one thing that is an opportunity in Australia is to both work with both of those groups. I've seen some interesting, um, I think when Australia is having productive conversations, they are doing things that bring these groups in and especially the farmers and trying to work to see how farmers can be part of the solution as opposed to just being seen as the, as a, um, a barrier to climate change. And I think that, I think that there's some prospect in Australia with working with farmers on some of these more innovative methods to decrease emissions from livestock, either through grazing patterns that help sequester carbon in the soil or through trying to scale up some of these new technologies that decrease methane emissions from cows. One of the organizations we recommend in Australia, Farmers for Climate Action, is trying to bridge these two worlds that are have kind of historically been a bit more opposed. You know, the farmers have not been a climate block, but trying to trying to understand how climate policy and farming policy can work together. So I think there's I think that's both a challenge and an opportunity because it's it's very top of mind in Australia, but it's a problem that we also have to deal with in the US and Europe and and other countries. The other thing in terms of mining, you know, there's a story I quite like. There's a big a big mining company in Australia called Fortescue, run by this guy named Andrew Forrest, who has become a bit of a radical climate champion. And he's trying to innovatively decarbonize all of this mining company's operations, like, you know, big electric mining vehicles and things like this. And I don't know if it's going to work, you know, but I think we just wrote this piece on, uh, we, we, I've talked a lot about donations, but we also have a bunch of uh, recommendations for businesses. And I'm inspired by the idea, we can get into this later, but like a lot of what businesses do, they want to check a box and say, we're doing something for climate. They might offset their emissions, which I think is, tends to be a lot of, a lot of BS. But the the businesses that are doing, I think, a really innovative job, one of the things I think they can do is think really hard. If you're a big business, you very much understand, you have very specific technical knowledge about your operations and where those emissions come from. So if you're, say, a mining company, if you want to spend some real money thinking about, okay, how do we electrify some of these major earth movers that we use? How do we electrify some of the transport? Um, will we actually invest in some of this technology that is going to have spillovers in the, in, in the industry, something that will probably not be profitable for us in the short term? That To me, that is an exciting action that, uh, that companies could take. And uh, I'm excited about this Australian mining company giving it a try. No, absolutely. And you should. I mean, as you said, no, like it's one of the first companies investing in such technology, having all the knowledge, industry knowledge already. And probably they're one of the first companies to enter the market. And mining technology will also be needed all over the world. So if you're the first one who has a footprint in that market, it can be actually a very smart move a very opportunistic move maybe not for the first five years or maybe not for the first 10 or 15 years but after that probably it is indeed a smart move thank you very much for that and yeah you already talked a little bit to companies and companies offset and maybe we can look a little bit into carbon offsets and removals and i want to quote here from your website it's the convention is for business to pursue net zero. So they calculate their own emissions and buy carbon offsets to cancel out those emissions. Can you give the audience who are not super familiar with carbon offsets and those removals two, three sentences on how does that work? Sure. So if you're a business or even an individual and you want to say I'm carbon neutral, well, generally what you do is you try and measure your own carbon footprint which, you know, you have different methods of doing that, but you kind of calculate all the things you do and come up with a number. And then you say, okay, let's 
pay some money to decrease emissions somewhere else uh, based on that payment. And there's this whole market built around carbon offsets where someone says, okay, I'm planting some trees in the Gambia. If you give me $20, I'll plant 20 trees and that will offset your emissions. So that's basically how it works. Okay. I have two follow-up questions. One is of very personal interest and I had to book a flight recently and there you can also offset your carbon emissions and usually you pay like a dollar, maybe two, maybe three. But also they were offering me and excuse me that I did not look into what exactly the name is, but a new source of airplane petrol or fuel and that was substantially more expensive so if i would have offset my flight that would have cost 70 or 80 dollars more do you know anything of that technology and is that a real offset or do you have any words on that that's a very personal inquiry of mine yeah okay so first of all i would say is if you check that box that says offset my flights i think that in general it's probably not doing anything i would recommend that you don't do it uh because the <laughs> The airlines, I think that there are thoughtful ways to do this and there are cheap ways to do this. And the thoughtful ways to do it are to think really hard about what projects are making a difference, are not being funded. Uh, and at Given Green, we're, we're trying to figure out some of these best offset projects, but they're a lot more expensive than the ones out there on the standard markets that you buy from the brokerage. And as far as I know, the airlines are buying the cheap ones. They don't do a lot. You know, the, the issue is that the main issue is that a lot of times you're paying people for things that would already happen. Like, oh, I'm building this solar plant in India. Can you pay me to do that? But like, this is already a profitable business enterprise. So those carbon offsets don't do anything. Now, this jet fuel stuff, I don't know the specific scheme that you're speaking about, but I am intrigued by this. You know, their aviation specifically is well known as one of the most difficult sectors to decarbonize. Doesn't really seem possible to do with batteries, which is how you're going to decarbonize a lot of stuff. And so one of the routes to decarbonization of airlines is to try to create carbon neutral jet fuel, which would basically mean that you pull you pull carbon dioxide from the sky and you use that carbon through some chemical processes to create jet fuel. It's technology that exists. It works in, you know, at small scales, but it's very expensive. Nobody knows, like, I don't know the exact, word, but it's like, you know, hundred times more expensive than normal jet fuel if you're actually, and I, I don't even think people can make enough to fill up an airplane. You know, it's like, it's stuff that exists in the labs. So I'm not exactly sure what you're buying when you buy this, this $70, but the idea that you could contribute somehow towards the innovation of might eventually solve this aviation emissions problem, that seems like a reasonable pathway uh, that I would find intriguing. But I need to know more about the specific schemes to say whether or not I'd recommend it. Absolutely. I will make sure to send you a screenshot because I did take one um, after this conversation latest and maybe we can either take that offline or take that into one of the conversations after we publish this podcast and then we can discuss if it actually does make sense or not. Just a side comment of mine that just came to mind if we think about, okay, this is a walkable way, even though we may not know which yeah, shoes to wear, but I was living in Amsterdam at that time and I had a roommate from Copenhagen and they, she told me that in Copenhagen at that time, they were separating like seven different types of waste, even though they only had the capacity to really separate them in a facility three or four. But she said, okay, the government understood very early that if we do not teach the people beforehand, we have that separation facility for seven or eight times, we will not get this change implemented on time or whenever we have it. So maybe this is a similar step that you say, okay, well, we already talk about this alternative for jet fuel, even though it's not there yet. So we already create maybe for now and somewhat artificial supply 
but we invest in R and D. I also would like to look into that and understand, okay, where is that dollar amount, euro amount, whatsoever actually coming from? I once, I, I was once asked to comment on, you know, Coldplay had some sort of like environmentally friendly world tour and they had some very ridiculous things like a kinetic dance floor where people danced it like powered the lights and i was like what a gimmick this is so stupid but the, then the journalist asked me is there anything that coldplay is doing that seems reasonable and they said that they were using a certain percentage of carbon free jet fuel on their flights and i okay. thought like okay well that sounds reasonable this is like we need more r d we need we need to solve this jet fuel problem and so if we can create some demand for it at really higher prices, maybe it will, yeah. Like you said, maybe it'll spur the innovation we need to actually make it viable. Talking about viable ways, I want to quote once more from your website. And it says, Giving Dream encourages companies to move away from immediate neutrality goals. We just discussed why. Instead of stopping at offsetting, we seek to help you maximize your climate impact. And my first question is, how can a company maximize their <clears throat> climate impact? And what does it even mean? Yeah, I mean, this is, it's, it's a little bit of a similar narrative that we suggest to both individuals and companies, which is don't think about your own carbon footprint. What is your carbon footprint really? matter in the grand scheme of things. What matters is thinking about the maximum good you can do with both your actions and your money. Like that's that's kind of part of this philosophy of effective altruism that we're trying to bring towards, towards the climate fight. So what can companies do that's, that really matters? So I think there's a lot that companies can do, but a lot of times they're going to be constrained and can't do them. You know, for instance, I think that policy is an extremely important issue and that companies have a lot of power for policy. Like when you have some sort of climate bill or climate provision, usually you have the Chamber of Commerce, which is like an industry group for businesses in the US. I'm sure you have something similar in Europe. They normally go up and they say, no, these provisions are bad for businesses, blah, blah, blah. Well, as a company, you can stop paying your dues at these trade organizations if they argue against climate bills. You can play an you can play a role in policy and you can also contribute to advocacy organizations that are helping write these bills and helping create the political pressure to pass them. So as I said time and time again, I really think that policy advocacy is one of the biggest levers and companies can, can participate in that. Now, realistically, a lot of companies are just not going to do this. Too politically dangerous too weird for their shareholders, too much outside their comfort zone. And, and so we realized this. So a lot of them, they'll just go down this offsetting road. And so that's where we're pushing back. And, and we're writing this piece now. There's a blog post on our website that lays it up a bit, but we're, we're working on a more detailed set of recommendations. But I think there's this really nice middle ground for companies that I'm really encouraging companies to push for, which is to say, how can you as a company be a part of the systemic solution of technology. And I think there's a couple ways that companies can do this. The first is a little bit like this Australia or example, the mining company that I gave you is, is there something where you as a company are a real expert at and you can deploy your company's expertise to solve a very specific problem where you have a comparative advantage? I'll give another example that I like. So, Google, when they assess their carbon footprint, one of the big pieces of their carbon footprint is um, their data centers. They're constantly running these gigantic server farms. They take a ton of energy. They need to be cooled. And it's interesting. They, like, they, they tend to place these data farms where energy is cheap because it's, it's big energy set. Now, what they would like to do is let's just use renewable energy to power our data centers. And what they used to do was to do it in sort of a bad way, which is that, so the issue, the issue with using renewable energy is it's very hard to store energy. We're just starting to get utility scale battery storage online. Really, you can only use solar energy when the sun is shining. You can only use wind energy when the wind is blowing. And realistically, almost all companies, they, they plug into the grid so they get whatever the grid has. And 
there are these kind of tricks to get you at root, get, get you renewable energy, which is to say like, okay, it's nighttime where this Google server farm is. So we're going to buy, we're going to kind of like subsidize renewable energy somewhere else. It's almost like an offset. You get this thing called a renewable energy credit, a REC, where someone making solar energy somewhere generates this credit and then Google buys it and then says, okay, we're really, we're using renewable energy, but really they weren't. It, it was night they were using gas. But so, but wait, this is supposed to be a good story. And so Google said, this is a problem that we want to solve. They said like, how can we create 24 seven real renewable energy for our data centers? And it wasn't possible, right? There's just wasn't a way to get renewable electrons into their data center at night. And so they said, well, let's try to solve this problem through innovation. And they, they put together a coalition, they're working with the UN, they have this 24 seven renewable electricity problem to try and solve this problem. Like, okay, what other electrosources do we need on? What type of transmission lines might we need to really ensure that you can get renewable energy at all times? And in kind of the medium term, they're hoping that this process innovation will power their renewable energy 24 seven, but it really should have What's exciting about it is not just that, it's that you are gonna get these spillovers in terms of the processes, in terms of how do you actually run a grid that can provide renewable energy all the time? What are the different technology mix you need? What is the transmission line you need that should hopefully make it possible for other companies and individuals, municipalities to get this 24 seven clean energy? Okay, I went, I went a little bit down a pathway there. Sorry, okay, I'll pause. <laughs> No, and that's perfectly fine. Thank you very much for sharing that example. I think it's very important because it's a company that's big enough to call it scalable. And as you said, you have ripple effects, right? We have four other companies, but we can also use this technology for Google, for any other tech company, for any other data center company. With that, Dan, I think we talked a lot about policy and we talked a lot about electricity. And I know that another topic of yours or a dear topic to you is food systems and the created emissions of such. We talked a little bit about it earlier. And also here, I would like to start off with some data. So we said that in 2022 or in 2021, we had roughly 50, 55 gigatons of CO2 emissions. And I found some data that somewhere between 25 and 30% of that accounts for the food industry. So roughly a quarter to almost a third. And I found another interesting data. I found it interesting in our world in data and those numbers are from 2019. And it says that those 26% of food or 26% of the global greenhouse gases are for food. Out of which 18% are for supply chains and they don't make a differentiation here between vegetables and livestock, but they continue. And 29% of the food industry is for human food or for crops for humans. And a staggering 53% is for livestock and fisheries. What do we learn from that? I think most of us know that if we would all eat a little bit more plant-based, that would be a good thing. But what does that tell us about greenhouse gas emissions in food in relation to yeah, meat, fish, and vegetables? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, those numbers around the food system sound right to me. It's a, it's a big source of emissions, but it's also, it's not quite like other things where we say like, let's just reduce all the emissions and we need to eat, you know, it's an important, we can't reduce, remove the food sector, but I think we can make it a lot more efficient. And I think you're right that the really, really big lever that we have to pull is meat consumption. Um, if you want to zoom in even more closely, yeah, so meat consumption causes a way out, outsized effect on of greenhouse gas emissions on the food system. And honestly, it's really, it's beef. You know, it's like, we can we can zoom in even closer. It's true that poultry and fish are worse than like grains, but we also need we need protein from somewhere, and most protein sources are are more than grains. So anyway, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's like it's like great you have grains, most grains, 
And then you have rice, which is worse than most grains because of methane emissions from rice patties. And you, if you think of like, and like rice and eggs and cheese are all kind of, and chicken and pigs are all kind of the same, much worse than grains when ours. And then beef is like 10 times worse, you know? So I think we have a major beef problem. And I think that decreasing emission from livestock is just a major, major societal goal that we need to work on. And that's actually a subject of a lot of our current research is what are the pathways really to decreasing emissions from livestock? <clears throat> what can we do as civil society, as nonprofits to try and to try and push that transition faster? I mean, there isn't really a transition happening now, but like to try and push that transition. You know, what are what are the pathways to decreasing beef consumption? And you know, I can speak a little bit more about that, but it's very complicated. And I think there's different levers, right? We can change the diets. We can reduce the food waste in general. We have like maybe improvements in agricultural efficiency. I think there's different ways. And if you talk about technologies or different ways of non-meat proteins, I found another study and that is from the cleantech 100 report from the cleantech group and it says in regard to the sector the 2022 cohort meaning the companies in that sector signals a change in the alternative protein sector as cultivated and fermented proteins outnumber plant-based alternatives for the first time the market favors more resource efficient production systems offering more flexible feedstock and production What are your thoughts on that? So when you think about the pathways out of meat consumption, um, beef consumption specifically, I, the one that I find to be the most promising is through alternative proteins. Uh, like you said, you have reduction of food waste. You have just behavioral change of people becoming vegetarians. Uh, you maybe have improving productivity or actually reducing the emissions per cow. We, we've, we've gone down all these pathways and I think that there's prospects in all of them, but I think to me, the realistic route is through technology and through developing alternatives that people like just as much as beef. Um, and so we are quite hopeful about the prospect of the alternative protein industry becoming a real competitor to live animals. Now, the question that you asked about, let's say you could divide the alternative protein industry further into what we call these plant-based versus cultivated. Maybe you have fermented also somewhere in the middle, but there's major, major disagreement within experts of this space about what this industry will look like. I think there are some very smart voices that are very bearish about the cultivated protein market saying that it's there are major technological barriers to scaling and other people disagree with that so i'm not quite sure where exact what which one of the sources the innovation comes from but i do think that the, if, there's lots of really good ideas out there and the innovation is coming from many different directions and that it's got to work <laughs> Somehow, maybe that's just the optimist within me, but um, I, I feel, I mean, I'm, I'm still a meat eater despite all of this, and I'm trying to reduce my meat consumption and I find it hard. So I like to think that I'm maybe a, like a, myself, I'm an interesting test case. And when I first, when I've had some of these products, like my, what I think is absolutely the best product is this starbucks impossible breakfast sandwich i don't know if you've ever had one i don't know if they have them in europe it's Im impossible foods is like a brand of alternative protein that i think is quite advanced and it just it tasted like meat i couldn't tell the difference it blows me away <laughs> okay and i just think like god like I had this eureka moment that was just like wow this can be done this is like there's no there's zero trade-off here and this is and five years ago i would have never said that like everything tasted like oh okay it kind of tastes like meat whatever um 
but I just have to think that the technology is getting there. We have different tools at our disposal. And if we can push this technology forward, I think it will win with consumers. And I, I think that's the only realistic way out. I, I just can't see like national campaigns trying to convince people to eat less meat. It's too close to the culture. It's You're going to get these backlash. And even if you think, if you think outside of, let's say the West, you think, I think of places where I've worked a lot, like Kenya, where beef is just part of the culture so deeply. And I think like, are we going to convince Kenya to become vegetarian? I don't, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem feasible to me, but we, could we convince Kenyans to have a really, really delicious product that tastes just like beef, but isn't, doesn't come from a cow. That seems much more realistic. Oh, that sounds very interesting. I haven't heard of impossible food, to be honest. I haven't been to a Starbucks for some time, but I eat plant-based myself. So I will certainly try to find impossible food and check that out. They are, I, I don't know if they've come to Europe. They are, I think, the, the vanguard of these companies in the US. But, I mean, they're much, more, much better known for the burger, the impossible burger, which really is the closest to a hamburger that I've ever had. And then now they have this pork product too. So if next, I don't, I don't know if it's in Europe. Next time you're in the US, you should try. <laughs> I'm sure it's coming. It's very successful I will here. For sure. <laughs> so, I mean, of course we have Beyond and of course we have a few other companies, but I haven't tried this impossible food, at least knowingly. But that leads me to another question outside of California and maybe outside of Austin those days, how would you say are U.S. citizens accepting those alternatives, even though they taste very similar? As you said, it's super ingrained into tradition, into culture, into the diet. And there's also, I believe, quite a bit of pride and the meat industry and the beef industry. Do you have any, probably it's a pretty subjective statement you want to give or not going to give, but do you have any feel how, yeah, is it accepted in the US or on the continent? I don't, I think it's accepted among the so-called urban, urban lefty elite <laughs> and not really in the heartland. Uh, but I also think the product isn't there yet. I think the product is pretty good. I mean, I did just tell you the story about this breakfast sandwich, but it's expensive. Um, you know, it's still, the products are more expensive. I think the the situation is that they are more expensive and not quite as good. And so that's not a winning product. You know, the product has to be better and cheaper. So it's more, I think I have more optimism for the future rather than saying it's here now. And I think, I think in the end, I mean, I am worried a little bit about cultural backlash. I think in the end, if you have a really good product, it'll, it will win over people who don't care about climate. Let me give a really good example. So Ford, you know, Ford cars, they have, re they've released an electric truck. That, so the best, one of the best vehicles in the US is the Ford F-150 pickup truck. Um, it's a massive profit center for Ford. They released the Ford F-150 Lightning electric vehicle. And the people who buy pickup trucks are not the urban elite. It's not people in San Francisco. It's people in Texas. And that thing is such a hit. Ford is, it sold out of its original order immediately. There's years long backlog to buy it. They, they're, they're doubling, tripling their production line. They can't get them into dealerships fast enough because it's just a terrific vehicle. You know, the electric The electric motor gives fast acceleration, fast, fast pickup. You can run, you can run your uh, tailgate, your tailgate barbecues before the football game can be run off the battery of the truck. You know, it's just winning in the marketplace. No one, people are not buying this because it's helping the climate. They're buying it because it's awesome. And I think that's what you have to do with the food system. Also, I'll tell you what, tomorrow, We were invited to some new food company. Um, I'm not going to give them product placement, but one of these new startups in San Francisco that uh, their innovation is combining lab-grown meats with plant-based meats. Apparently, it's a lot easier to grow fat in a lab than it is to grow other types of cells. And also, 
when you have like the impossible burger is this the plant-based burger they just use coconut oil as the fat and it's not quite as good so a lot of people are saying that the next thing is going to be combining the lab-grown fat with the uh, plant-based protein put together. I'm going to try one of these future sausages tomorrow, and I'll, I'll let you know how it is. And you should let us know how it actually <laughs> did taste. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. It's not commercially available, but we managed to. We managed to snag an invite because they knew we were writing some of these research reports. <laughs> Super cool. You should enjoy the party and enjoy that snack burger sausage whatever they're gonna feed you wonderful that sounds super cool then one other big topic that is closely related to the food industry is deforestation and maybe you can give us a glimpse why they are so closely connected and what each and everyone maybe even could do about deforestation other than just being aware of it they're closely related because Land use for agriculture is the major driver of deforestation um, in the world, but specifically in South America and in Indonesia, which are the two largest areas of deforestation. So I think before I started getting into this, I thought that the reason people was cutting down were cutting down trees was because they needed the wood, um, which is true in some places. Uh, it's actually somewhat true in Argentina and in uh, in certain parts of Africa where they're using biomass, but it's mostly people are cutting down trees because they want the land and they want the land specifically in Brazil. They want the land for cattle grazing, or sometimes they want the land to grow crops, which are then fed to cattle because like you've mentioned before, like 50% of, well, I'm not, I don't want to say a, a number. I'm not sure. Some large percentage of food crops are used for cattle feed. So when you think about how we prevent deforestation, a lot of places are trying to prevent deforestation through legal enforcement or through working with communities to help them defend their own land or making protected areas. And I don't have anything wrong with these programs, but I also think that, that if you have a, strategy to stop deforestation and you don't and you don't address the underlying demand for deforestation that it's going to be unsuccessful because that you stop deforestation in one place with your great program that demand is going to move somewhere else and the demand is just being driven by agricultural products and at least in south america beef is the driver so I think if you want to, if you want to do a really systematic um, attack of deforestation, I think you once again are led to reducing beef consumption. It's not, I don't want to oversimplify it's different products in different areas, it's palm oil in Indonesia, it's beef in Brazil, but the same lever one of the reasons why reducing beef consumption is so important, you know, it's in that other calculation we had about beef being so important is because it's driving deforestation. So um, I think if we can be more efficient in our food systems, as in less beef, fewer animals, then we need less land. And then there's just less pressure to go and expand land and cut down trees. No, absolutely. Thank you very much for elaborating on that. And just another number that I found is that the tropics lost 11.1 million hectares in tree cover in 2021. And of particular concern are 3.75 million hectares of loss that occurred within tropical primary rainforests. And that is an equivalent to a rate of 10 football pitches a minute. So this is the degree to which we are losing trees and losing trees in rainforests. And I really am with you that we do not only have to fight the symptoms, but also the root cause, right? And this is the agriculture, the food system, and yeah, find the levers there. Obviously, there's also other deforestation happening. That's not only for the agricultural movement, but I think if we tackle the food system first or with the focus, then we can also tackle a lot of the deforestation already. 
then I do have three questions that I ask each and every one of my podcast guests. But before we go there, I have two or three questions. And the first one would be, if we think about how can I personally fight climate change or educate myself about climate change mitigation a little better, what are books or resources that you frequently recommend? Um, I think our website, givinggreen.earth, is pretty good. <laughs> um, one book that I like that is a little bit, a little bit more technology focused than I would like, uh, maybe ignoring politics a little too much, but I really do quite like Bill Gates's book, How to Avert a Climate Disaster. I really like that it goes over all the technologies bit by bit and tries to look at how far away the green technologies are, um, are from the vanguard. So I think that's just the one that pops into my mind as a nice, just a really easy to access overview to like, what are the problems? What are the solutions? What is the innovation we need to get there? Thank you very much, Dan. I will make sure to link both of those resources. And I will, of course, also make sure to link all your socials. But I'm sure that people maybe are interested in finding out more about yourself and reaching out. And my next question would be, how can they do so? How can people engage and reach out to you? Yeah, I think the best thing to do is to go to the givinggreen.earth website and we have a contact form or website there. I think it's oh no, givinggreen at idinsight.org is the email address. And I, that actually does come to my email address along with some of my colleagues. Uh, and then also we have a contact form. I think that if, you know, as an organization, we are looking for uh, collaborators, partners, donors, if you are a potential someone who is interested in getting into the climate philanthropy space and would like some advice, we're happy to talk. If you are a business that's trying to figure out how to do better with their CSR strategy, we're happy to talk. If you are a donor who wants to support an organization like ours, we're happy to talk. If you're a journalist um, who wants to write more about us, we'd love to speak. So, you know, we're we're really open to inbound inquiries of people who can help help us amplify our message. Wonderful. And I can very much confirm that and yeah, acknowledge you, Dan, and your team for what you guys are doing with Giving Green and with all the initiatives that you're leading and all the research you're doing. So thank you very much for that. And that leads me to my final three questions. The first one, I believe you already hinted at the answer, but is what influenced or motivated you over the past week? Yeah, what I already said it. What motivated me was uh, yesterday Biden signing this big climate bill in the U.S. It's just an amazing, amazing victory that's exciting to me. It really is. Thank you so much. And the second question would be, who are your mentors or whom do you look up to? Who are my mentors who I look up to? You know, I have, there have been a few leaders at the organization I work with, ID Insight. First, some of the some of the founders, for instance, one, one our former CEO who sits on our, uh, on our advisory board, Buddy Shah, has been a, a mentor and a cheerleader for the Giving Green organization since the beginning. And also my, uh, the current CEO of ID Insight, Ruth Levine, has been a, a helper, um, has really helped get, get us off the ground and helped been a connector and been a yeah, been a mentor in terms of, let's say, leadership and management and organization that um, that maybe I needed as kind of a entrepreneur, <laughs> if you say. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And that leads me to the last and final question, Dan, and that's a rather hypo hypothetical one. I call it the three truths. And I would like you to imagine that you are traveling in space all by yourself and actually for quite some time. So for a few months or even for a few years. And after some travel, some solo travel, you encounter a human-like species. And they can only process three facts or three truths about humanity before they decide whether or not they want to get to know us. What do you tell them? <laughs> Did you send these these questions before and I just missed them? Or am I supposed to be thinking this up off the hand? 
No. I I did not share them beforehand. I'm sorry, my friend. You did not share them. I think I would tell them that that humans are both very smart yet also have a lot to learn. That that humans both across the population can be aggressive and dangerous but also very kind and loving even within the same people or across the same population and also that humans sometimes fight together fight against each other but also sometimes work together to solve amazing problems and when we work together uh we have incredible accomplishments wonderful and the optimist in me here's learning here's kind and loving and here's <laughs> collaboration then thank you so much for that very insightful conversations and if you have any final words for our audience it's all yours i would just say uh i encourage everyone to come take a look at givinggreen.earth and uh and please reach out if you'd like to get involved wonderful thank you so much dan take care If you enjoy this podcast and learn from it, please feel free to share this episode with a friend or two and make sure to subscribe to the Just Another Mindset podcast on YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please use the next 10 seconds to give the Just Another Mindset podcast a rating and know that you will help me to create more meaningful content like this and also that it will help other people to find this content and get inspired as well. If there is any future topic or guest that you would like to hear more about on the Just Another Mindset podcast, please let me know by leaving a comment on YouTube or sending a mail directly to contact at ishmaelwondergarten.com. And if nobody told you lately, be reminded that you are worthy, you matter, and you can achieve anything. Just another mindset.